Oh wait, hold on. I don't have Audacity open. God, I'm a noob. I did like did like two podcasts last week, and they don't use it, so I'm out. I'm out of the. Out of I understand it's your first time doing a podcast. <laughs> We're the only ones that I've been on like recently that you still still record locally. It's kind of weird. All right, I'm ready. Chad, you good? Chad, are you alive? Chad, take the dick out of your mouth and talk. <laughs> Yikes. <laughs> You're muted or something, bro. I'm not, there. Oh, there you, there go. you go. My first podcast, so. <laughs> hey. All right, let's record in three, two, one, record. Rolling. We'll get started in just a second here. All right, you are back with the DLF Dynasty podcast. This is DLF Dynasty podcast number 268, and you're here with me, your host, Dan Myler. We're going to cover some late-round rookie drafts and do a preseason checklist on this week's episode. But before we get to any of that stuff, I want to bring in my co-host. We got the whole crew on board today. We got Matt Price and Chad Scott. Matt, we'll start with you. How are you doing, bro? I'm doing great. I'm excited to have the band back together. You know, we've had all these guests on recently, and it's been great. But uh, I'm really excited to be able to just sit down and chat with you two fellows. Yeah, we've had a really great guest list. A lot of DLF guys. We reached out to the the rest of the industry as well, and have had a lot of a lot of good names, quality content for sure. I think all of our listeners would agree with that. But the chance to get the three of us back together and just chat, do a little bit of strategy stuff, talk a little bit about these rookies, which we've kind of ignored for the last few weeks because we talked about that so much over the last few months. Chad, are you as excited as me and Matt? Yeah, I am, man. Uh, so much seems to have changed since since uh, the NFL draft and and when we first did, you know, our first rookie drafts in May, and and here we are in August, you know, a couple weeks away from actual NFL uh, regular season games, man. There's there's so much to talk about, uh, a lot of a lot of changing, a lot of moving parts uh, in the dynasty world. So it's gonna it's gonna be a good episode, man. I'm excited to be back with you guys. Yeah, we're gonna talk about all those rookies in a little bit, but first. Let's talk a little bit of strategy. We don't get a lot of time to, to talk about that in season. So this is our last chance to really uh, dive into what we do strategy wise. We're going to talk a little bit about what we do in season a little later. Right now, I want to focus on this time of year, the preseason right now. Exactly. While these guys, all these listeners are tuning in. Uh, they want to know what we're doing when we look at our rosters on MFL or another website. Uh, what, we're, what, what clicks of the mouses we're making to try to improve our roster. But let's talk first about the preseason itself, fellas. Chad, are you a, are you a preseason watcher? Do you, t- do you tune in? Do you check out the box scores? What are you doing during the, these four weeks of the NFL preseason? Oh God, yeah, man. I I have to be a preseason watcher. I I, I live in Seattle, so if I, it's either that or watch the Seattle Mariners, and uh, I don't really want to do that. So <laughs> it's, it's yeah, it's all about the NFL, man. I'm I'm just excited it's back, and every game, no matter who's playing, like even the Browns the other day, uh, they were playing. I was excited to watch that on I think it was Monday night. Uh, I was excited to watch that, watch the QBs, see how they did. Um, yeah, man, it's I watch everything, and I. It, you know, I, I might overreact to preseason, but I'd rather overreact than underreact. And I think that was a big thing on Twitter uh, the last few weeks. You know, it's like the big cool hipster thing to do is like underreact to, to preseason. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm not into that. I'd rather be wrong on, on, on somebody cheap that I'm going in on in my leagues than, than miss out completely just because I didn't want to believe the hype. So. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I, I kind of share a brain with you on that. I, I agree. I like to watch a lot of preseason action. I'm that guy that goes to the TiVo and records three or four games when they're when they're on and over my lunch break or whatever, try to check at least check out the first half of those games to get a good look at, at the players that I really want to see. Matt, are you doing the same thing? Yeah, I watch uh, a few of the games live, and then I go back on Game Pass and I watch those condensed games, which are the best thing ever, in my yes. opinion, for for preseason because you can watch the whole game in about half an hour and not miss a play. So I love those. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm all in on the preseason too. I I don't I don't really follow the narrative that the preseason doesn't matter. 
uh, there's there's people every uh, players every year out of the preseason that end up being fantasy relevant. So uh, I want to I want to be able to watch those guys. Yeah, and I think the thing is not necessarily right now. It's not like may, maybe these guys that are stars in the preseason that we're watching right now aren't going to turn it on right away when the lights come on here in a couple weeks in week one. But there's guys like Victor Cruz a few years ago or more than that now. His rookie year, he really came on in that preseason. And most dynasty owners, or a lot of us anyway, didn't really know a lot about Victor Cruz, saw those games, added him to rosters, and then had to wait an entire season for him to actually make an impact to our to our teams. And those are the kinds of things we're seeing right now. We're through a couple of weeks of this preseason, and there are names that we'll get to in a little bit that – quite honestly, weren't on a lot of dynasty players' radars. And now, whether they be rookies, second- or third-year players, they're they're kind of showing their stuff, and they're going to become game or, or fantasy relevant down the road. So let's talk a little bit about the more about these games. What specifically, Matt, are you looking at when you watch these games? So you turn on the game pass, and you, you want to check these guys out. Do you make a list of those players or maybe even a mental list of those guys you want to look for and keep your eye closely on them? Or are you just watching the game as if it was the regular season and hoping something catches your eye? Uh, a little bit of both, I guess. Uh, like in terms of the veterans, like the guys we expect to perform well, you know, I think for me, like I'm not really looking for them to to blow the, the roof off the stadium. You know, that's, that's kind of expected, I think, in the preseason when the def- defenses aren't really showing what they're going to do. Um, I think the things that are really concerning are things like, Blake Bortles, for instance, for uh, for instance, you know, like those veterans that are struggling against those defenses that aren't really showing anything, struggling against those, those, uh, you know, those second string players, that kind of thing. So those are the things I'm looking for for the vets in terms of the youth. You know, I just want to see them come out and play. Uh, you know, it's hard to say how good Trubisky is going to be in, in in the regular season in his rookie year, but in the preseason, he sure looks good. And I mean, it's better to see that than it is to see him struggle against those guys. So um, those are just a few of the things I'm looking for. I, I think I'm, I'm mostly trying to look at, at those vets and making sure that they're still performing up to snuff, you know, because um, if they're not performing against these kind of defenses, then, then we might have to rethink what we're thinking they're going to do in the regular season. Absolutely. And with those veterans, I think the thing for me is I want to see if they're running with the ones. Are are they in the field with that number one quarterback? Are they playing deep into the third or fourth quarter? Because that's not a real good sign. That means you're playing with the twos and the threes. And you might even find your way with to, to a pick slip here in a couple of weeks. And so so that's kind of a you know the eye catcher for me with the veterans. I'm like you. I don't get too excited about how they necessarily play right away. You kind of expect them to have big games. When you see Aaron Rodgers on the field, you expect him to pick apart a defense in the preseason because those guys aren't coming at him full strength and, and using all those stunts and those blitzes. Not usually. Anyway, how about you, Chad? What are you looking for uh, specifically with the young players? Is there something that you're looking at or are you just watching the game in general? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm watching the game in general, but, you know, you- I think we all, when we're watching a game, we all have key players that, you know, we've, we've heard about or have talked about and maybe own in dynasty already. I want to see, especially like you, like you mentioned for the rookies and sophomores, you know, are they playing with the ones uh, is the running back uh, in on third downs to protect pass protect. Cause that, I think that says a huge thing. They're willing to let that running back risk the life of a quarterback basically in preseason. Uh, so I think that's a good sign, but yeah, if, if there's a wide receiver getting uh getting balls thrown to him by the QB one for that team. I think that's also a good sign. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not looking so much for output, but like maybe just how they're being used when they're being used and, you know, maybe snap totals trending in the right direction as the preseason goes, goes yeah, on. And if they're, if they're getting looks from that starting quarterback, that's a big deal. Yeah. A lot, a lot like what you said, Matt, with the whole Blake Bortles thing, that storyline is really unique. We don't see that very often. The whole ups and downs there, coaching staff, throwing that guy under the bus like that. And then how that affects the rest of the roster. I know I have a salary cap, auction free agent auction coming up and I, I Alan Robinson is a part of that and that has totally affected my view of him he, he's really gone up and down and watching these preseason games and I'll have another chance to to see the Jaguars before ultimately making this decision boy I, I'd really like well, to see him get some chemistry in the, the this last chance before I have to make that decision I know a lot of us dynasty owners don't get that uh, benefit that don't have to they don't get the chance to you know remake the decision after you added Allen Robinson this offseason but I do and, and when I'm watching that game 
man, when I watched it last week, I was so disappointed. Like everybody watching the game, Bortles cannot get him the ball, and that's really affecting how we judge these players. And that's what I want to talk about next, fellas. Did you see, real we- quick, real quick, Dan, did you see that uh, Henny was named the starter for preseason week three? Yeah, I, so. I saw that he was named named for week three, and I think that's a really good opportunity uh, for him. I think that's the coaching staff trying to throw one more jab at, at Bortles and say, oh, we're serious about this. You better bring your A game. I think it's still a 50-50 competition, but at this point we really have to anticipate it's going to be Henny if that's the case, right? If, if Henny is the starter, how does that make you feel about Allen Robinson? Does that make you feel better or worse? Well, you know, I think it's a mixed bag. I don't know if it really affects me. It's not like Henny lit the world on fire when he came in. I'd like to see him get a little bit of, I don't know, go to Robinson and actually deliver him the football when he's wide open and, and not throw it at his feet or not even to his feet. I mean, it's embarrassing to watch. And, and as a Robinson owner in multiple places, it just, you know, to see him break free is – and not get the ball or not even have a chance to catch the ball is so frustrating because you know the talent's there. So that, that body Henny language can't be that much worse. And you're right about the body range. The that's body right. language is like you see Allen Robinson shrug his shoulders, drop. Like it's the preseason, man. <laughs> yeah, this is the preseason. But but it's obviously happening happening every day in practice for okay. him to be that frustrated, right? Yeah. So so let's talk about how these performances in the preseason affect us and specifically with our rankings. I know we all like to do do rankings and we we publish them and things like that. Matt, let's start with you. When when you see this guy explode first of all and have that big preseason maybe it's a guy we're not really that that's not really on the radar uh or maybe a deep sleeper are you quick to move that guy up your rankings are you quick to make those moves to try to trade for or add him on the waiver wire honestly i'm i'm generally selling them if i if i have them depending on the player and how i felt about them before i saw them in this you know blow up game or whatever you know like for instance kenny galladay like i I liked him coming in i like i still like him but i don't know if i like him as much as everybody else he's going and for first round picks now uh, plus in in addition uh, you know extra first round picks so i don't i don't know about that um i don't know like it just depends on the player i think for me I, I, i really try to stick to how i felt about the player entering the 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 pre-draft season um and if it's a play i I guess i'm looking more for like confirmation like for example christian mccaffrey like i loved him coming in i love everything i see in the preseason i think it is so glaring like the the, uh the amount of talent he has compared to jonathan stewart apparent uh, at this point in his career like i just think that's such a glaring thing so i do think i still keep a little bit of my my evaluation before the pre for the preseason process i guess we can call it um but you know i I think like chad said earlier i think it's better to overreact than underreact and in this case i think i'm maybe i'm overreacting by selling so early you know maybe i'm selling ended up i'm selling low but the fact that if i I paid a fourth round or a third round pick and now can get a first rounder for him you know i'm willing to do that all day for a for a guy that i think feel like is hyped up yeah, I, I typically feel the same way, and it, like you said, it depends on the situation. H- how about you, Chad? What do you think of these guys that are that are having the big preseason out of nowhere? Yeah, you know, it's <laughs> I'm such a hype whore. Like, I I don't I don't like selling guys like a Kenny Galladay. I've, I have him in a few spots, and I'm I'm so hesitant on even though I've seen like some of the trades that's gone down uh, in his favor, like in the last few weeks. I'm so hesitant on trading because like Matt said, it's like, am I, am I selling too soon? And, you know, do I want this production? You know, maybe not year one, but in year two, is, is it going to be like, is he going to have this, this amazing production? And I don't know if that's going to be the case. He's going to be what, 25, I think heading into year two. Um, so he's already kind of closing in on the apex range for, for wide receivers. And man, I, uh, I, I, I tend to not try to like, underreact preseason but i'm kind of i almost kind of stand still in most dynasties unless somebody like completely blows me away with an offer that you know i can't like resist at at some point so yeah that's interesting it's kind of two different philosophies that the two of you have uh matt you say you're willing to sell if, if these hype guys go and it's a little more difficult for you chad uh, in, in the same way, Chad, are you willing to buy guys like Galladay? Is, is that a guy you're targeting if, if there's a trade going down or somebody asks about a different player? Uh, I, I'm not buying. I'm, I usually don't buy hype. So, like, okay. 
Kenny Kenny Hall you Galladay just don't might sell be. It. <laughs> yeah, like I want to sell it, but I'm not going to buy it. But like I will. I know, right? You just want to so, feel good inside about like all that. Samaj, like, yeah, like Samaj P. Ryan, right? Like this is a guy I, I liked coming out, and I, I thought he was a good uh, late first round rookie pick. Um, now he's struggled. He's you know the past pro. He's behind uh, Rob Kelly uh, in the depth chart. Uh, his hype isn't there, so he's a guy I would look to buy. Somebody who I always, I kind of already liked in the process beforehand, maybe struggling in the preseason, that I can maybe get for a better value now if I didn't get him already. Yeah, those those are all good points, and it's a good lead-in for what I want to talk about next. We're going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about roster management throughout the preseason. Now, most of us have been kind of holding our thumbs, waiting for waivers to kick off, waiting for the season to, to get real information flowing in. Now that the preseason is here, a lot of that has started. In most leagues, we can, we can go on the waiver wire every week and put in those bids for, for these players. So let's talk a little bit about waivers. I know we touched on them just a little bit. Let's talk about that that fab bidding, first of all. How aggressive are you going to be for guys that, you know, maybe not not exploding, those guys like we've mentioned here with Galladay and, and the others, but the guys that look like an opportunity is right around a corner, maybe a guy that's on a bench somewhere is a third string running back that none of us were really paying attention to that all of a sudden could that get that second job, whether it be from injury or, or just playing well. Uh, are, are you – are you free to spend quickly with that cash, Chad? Are, are you one of those guys that are going to jump onto waivers early, or are you going to save that money for in-season when it really counts? Yeah, I, I tend to jump early, man, just because I'm, I'm so impatient when it comes to dynasty. <laughs> like, and like, and it really depends on my roster. Uh, am I a contender? Am I a pretender? You know, do I have roster spots to burn? Uh, are there veterans that you know have, uh, aren't really going to do anything really have no upside left at this point that I can get rid of at that point. Yeah. I'm going to be aggressive in my bids. I'm looking at five, 10, 15% on just covering the whole slew of hype players uh, in the preseason. And, and hopefully, you know, I'll get two, three, four out of those, uh, out of those bids. Matt, I'm one of those guys that believes in handcuffs, especially in dynasty because you can do it a little bit and it's hard to get useful players on your roster in a dynasty league. It seems like in this preseason stretch, you can find that third string guy that's going to get bumped up to that second string guy and you can find him on the waiver wire. So, so I'm a believer in trying to find those guys, those diamonds in the rough, even if the starter isn't on my team. So I'm, I'm kind of like Chad. I like to be aggressive if that, that opportunity is around the corner. Are you the same way? Oh, oh, for sure. And just to give a couple examples, guys, I've been buying this offseason, whether or not I have the starter in front of them or not, are guys like Damian Williams, you know, um, guys like uh, Brandon Oliver behind Melvin yeah. Gordon, who I think could have a big role this year. Um, yeah. You know, those kind of guys I really like to go ahead and jump on. A, a, a few of my leagues, especially the ones that I run, we like to do a a, a big like free agent auction right before. So just, so I got those guys pretty cheap in this one, you know, and it's fun. Uh, I, I don't mind spending, you know, all of my, my fab for the year if I have to in the precinct, if there's guys that I like, you know, you always have first come first serve waivers there to pick up, you know, things that, that you actually need to fill maybe injuries or suspensions or bye weeks or whatever, or what have you. So if I can get a guy that I can get now and either flip or, or, you know, turn into a spot starter throughout the year, you know, the earlier I get those guys that I can use spot starters, the more value that they're going to have to me because I get to use them for the whole season. So um, I'm definitely not shy about spinning on my, uh, my fab in the, in the, in the, in the preseason. Yeah, you, you said it perfectly there. If you get them early, you get to use them all year, and they're even more valuable. So you might as well take your shots there. And it's difficult to find really useful players. The the handcuffs is a big one to me. Brandon Oliver, you mentioned, he, he's been a target of mine all year. A guy that's a little higher on lists and on most rosters that you have to trade for, Jonathan Williams out of Buffalo. He's a guy that I've been targeting in a lot of places. And that leads me to preseason trades. Uh, same question, Chad. Are you aggressive when it comes to trading in the preseason? You touched on it just a little bit that you're not willing to necessarily trade off those those guys with the big hype. You are aren't going to buy the hype either, but you're looking for those guys that are that are you know you mentioned Pirine that hasn't played up to the level you were expecting. Are you aggressive overall trying to add to your roster at this time of year? No, not not through trade so much, just because I think everybody's uh, kind of playing chess with all their pieces at this point. Uh, you know, all, all the leagues that we're in, I mean, they're all they're all a bunch of 
Twitter guys that know Dynasty and they know the ins and outs. And, you know, they're all smart guys that we, that most of us play with. And uh, there's no, there's, I, don't, I just don't find any, that I can find any value in a lot of trades um, when you're doing it in the pre, in the middle of preseason, especially because, like I said, I mean, guys either get compromise, confirmation bias or they're just, they've, they've, they've got this guy and they've nailed exactly what they thought they did in the preseason. So it's going to translate. So it's just hard to find that kind of value. So I'm usually, like I said, man, I'm, I'm usually kind of standing, standing tall on my dynasty teams until the regular season starts. Yeah, I think you hit it there. We're not going to rob anybody in the leagues that we typically play in a lot of good owners, quality dynasty players. And it's hard to pull the wool over any of these guys as eyes. Matt, I'm one of the guys that, you know, like typically in a dynasty league, we don't really think about bye weeks because we're buying into these guys for the long haul for their entire career for the most, for the most part. Uh, this is the time of year I like to take a look at those bye weeks to see if I have any trouble. Is that something you're doing and are you, you using that if you have an overlap on your buys to, to target somebody in a trade? Not really. I mean, if it's at a position like in a start one quarterback league and both my quarterbacks have the same buy, I might try to flip my backup for somebody of equal value, that kind of thing. Same thing at tight end. But for the most part, you know, I don't mind stacking up bye weeks. And in fact, in redraft leagues, sometimes I like to try to stack all my buys on one or two weeks. So I have everybody else available for the rest of the season. So um, I don't, I don't really focus on them too much except for at those onesie positions. Yeah. I just like to go through my schedule Uh, Make sure I don't have a horrible week because that does happen from time to time. And if there's an opportunity out there, I do like to take take advantage of it if I can. Last thing on this subject, fellas, I think I think the only bit of advice I'd like to give, or or not really advice, I guess it's more of a thing to keep in mind or or something that you don't want to overlook, is if you haven't set your week one lineup for for here in a couple weeks, it's time to do that. You need to make sure you're covered, all your bases are, all your I's are dotted and all your T's are crossed. Is there anything else, fellas, that you, that you like to do this time of year to make sure that everything's covered for the regular season? I, uh, I just kind of a quick story. I love that little like preseason kind of ch- chad used the word chess match so like you set your starting lineup and then your first week week one opponent starts sets his starting yeah. lineup and you're like oh you're gonna start that guy huh and so you change a little bit here and there that kind of like back and forth i kind of i really enjoy that um but uh no yeah set your week one lineup now so you don't forget because there's a lot of stuff going on between now and then can i ask you guys how do you so i think all of us are in lines i'm assuming i'm in in Finally, so I have a spreadsheet uh, open basically weeks one and all the leagues I'm in. And I every time I set the lineup, I check the box that I set it. How do you guys normally do that so you don't forget? I, I'm a little bit more uh, old school, I guess. I have a piece of paper that I write all the names of the leagues on and I, I put a check mark <laughs> on it that says I, I've set the league. Uh, that, and I also do the, the waiver wire. I have a check mark for the waiver wire every week as well, yeah, just to make sure yeah. I'm not missing anything. Like a lot of dynasty owners, I'm a busy guy. I have a family. I have a lot of going on. I have a full-time job as well. So it's easy to overlook one league and then a week later be like, oh man, that that's going to hurt me. And all it does is taking – it just takes once where you miss out on somebody on waivers or didn't switch your lineup and set it correctly. Uh, I also have a Sunday checkbox that Sunday morning I go back yep. through <laughs> yeah, uh, and totally. make sure that lineup's just right and there wasn't that late uh, late scratch that hurts me. Yep. So that pretty much does it for this segment. We're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, uh, Chad, Matt, and myself, we'll talk a little bit about – late season rookie drafts we're gonna cover those top guys that that top five that everybody talks about as well as everybody else who's moving up who's moving down stick with us you're not gonna want to miss it welcome back to the dlf dynasty podcast i am your host dan myler and i am here with my partners in crime uh matt price is with me of course I forgot my Bo- name again <laughs> no i, I see my and, price and matt <laughs> M. pricer is with us as well as uh chad scott 
Uh, we're all three on board this week to talk a little bit about late season rookie drafts. I know a lot of us got all, all those things out of the way early in the year, right after the NFL draft, but there's still a few of us, I being one of them, uh, that has a couple late season rookie drafts, late August Drafts are a lot of fun because things change so much between the NFL draft and kickoff of week one. Now we're in that part of the year where we're getting to see these guys on the field playing against NFL talent. And there are some guys coming up from the fourth round and, and landing in the second or third round. And at the same time, there's guys in the even first and second round falling down into those later rounds. So let's start at the top as we always do, Matt. Corey Davis, he hasn't practiced since early in camp. He's still on track to be on the field this preseason and play in week one. Is he still your number one pick if you're drafting today? Uh, I think I'm probably basing it on running back or wide receiver need at this point. If I need a wide receiver, I'm definitely taking Corey Davis if I need has a it, running back. I'm has it always taking- been that way for you? Was it that way the day after the NFL draft? Um, yeah, I think so. Kind of. I think it was Corey Davis or my favorite running back at 101 for sure. Okay. I I think I I can get on board with that for sure. Chad, what do you think after, after Davis first is Davis, your, your top pick. And then who are you taking net two if Davis goes number one? My first pick always has been always will be. Uh, but I think, you know, I, it was Leonard Fournette, and I I think it's going to have to be like, a, a 1B and 1C and Christian McCaffrey, who I didn't believe in, but now I do, uh, between him and, and Mixon. Yeah, it, it's tough. It's it's really close. When you get when you get past Davis, and, and Davis would be my guy as well if I, if I had that top pick. Uh, and, and I even think that there's going to be owners out there that are going to fade for net at this point, Matt. And go with these guys that are proving it in the preseason. Are you willing to to go that far and take one of these other guys like McCaffrey, who you mentioned earlier? I am. This is this is probably very hot takey, but I'm I've moved Fournette down to five for me. Yeah. I okay. just I just I just don't like what's happening in Jacksonville at all. Like it's another year where we're like, you know, it has to be this year for Jacksonville. Look at all the talent on the defense. Look at they got Tom Coughlin in there. And I don't know, man. Now we've got the foot injury. I'm just I, – I, I just don't feel good about Fournette right now, and I'm probably making a mistake. But just the way I feel about him right now, he's, he's below everybody else for me. So if I add everything together there, if, if you're in need of a running back and sitting at 101, you're taking McCaffrey then, right? I am absolutely taking McCaffrey there. I just think he's – he, it might not happen for him this year. You know, Stewart may take – 150, 200 carries and most of the touchdowns, but he just looks so good in that offense. You know, I, I've never really bought into the, and we haven't even seen Cam Newton yet, but I've never really bought into the narrative that he can't do it just because he hasn't d- done it in the past in terms of dumping off to his running back. And uh, we had Mike Tagliari on last week, and he was really concerned about the size. I didn't really get into it too much, but I really think that McCaffrey is one of those kind of slippery backs that never really takes a big hit. So I don't know. I, I'm, I'm in love with him. I, I'm happy to take him at 101 all day if I don't need a wide receiver. Yeah, that's I'm, like. I'm, sorry, that was like the Russell Wilson uh, sort of quasi comparison because that's what uh, people say about Russell Wilson a lot. You know, he's kind of a smaller quarterback who runs, but he avoids the big hit almost every time. You know, excluding last year, of course. But that was in the pocket. It's just outside the pocket, and that's that's exactly what I see out of McCaffrey. So that's that's funny that you said that. So a couple I mean, weeks ago, fellas, every every or every draft that you looked at, it was Delvin Cook going five overall. And it was pretty consistent across the board. I have to imagine that's changed for at least some people after watching Cook be that workhorse tailback in Minnesota over these first couple of weeks of the preseason. Chad, are you willing to move him higher than five at this point? Uh, In Dynasty, no. But he will probably be the first rookie running back I draft and redraft, I would think. Okay. So, So to take it the next step, we're in a salary cap together chad if we were drafting that today and you could only give a three or a four-year contract would you be willing to move him up oh man just to give him a three yeah if you can only give him a three or four year even a four-year contract are you willing to take those other guys or are you gonna take cook like you wouldn't redraft uh i'd probably I'd probably oh, take the other guys. I put yeah. you on the spot. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, I, don't, that's I, don't really love, I don't love giving running backs like 
three and four year contracts anyway. Right. Uh, I play in a lot of salary cap and auction and contract leagues in general. And I think it's a really interesting question. And, I, you know, I believe the whole McCaffrey thing. I believe the Cook stuff. Joe Mixon, that's a three headed attack in Cincinnati. And, and the injuries with Fortnette, I think it's really interesting. If you only get the first three years of a career, who are you taking? It's a tough question. For sure. But let's move away from these top five. Matt, I want to hear it from you. This is a big question for me. Who's the sixth guy? After those top five, I think it's probably consensus across the industry and with most dynasty owners for sure. Mike Williams was that guy for so long, but with the injury down there in Los Angeles, we there's just too many question marks. Are you taking him at six or going somewhere else? Yeah, I'm going somewhere else, and this is this might be a shocker too because I hated this player, and I still really kind of don't like him. But uh, oh Alvin God. Kamara has really yeah. impressed me. I'm gonna say it. Alvin <laughs> Kamara has really, really impressed yeah. me. So, uh, I it, it, gun to my head, I would. I mean, I, I would really like to take OJ Howard or my, whatever my favorite tight end is there. But gun to my head right now, I think I would probably take Kamara. So that's that's really interesting because you and I have sat on this very podcast talking Absolutely. about Alvin. Don't call me Kamara, call me Kamara. Have you heard that one? <laughs> I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when I watched like that game, call, his, his, mom his calls own him. mother calls him Kamara. It's <laughs> yeah. interesting for sure. How about how about you, Chad? Are you, are you going with Kamara, Kamara, or somebody else? I mean, Kenny Galladay, isn't it? I mean, we just <laughs> talked about him. Like, yeah, kidding. No, it's <laughs> kidding. Uh, yeah, actually, I have uh, Kareem Hunt was kind of like my 107-ish uh, before – Pre, you know, before the preseason, uh, I would say either him or Kamara as well, because it. I didn't. <laughs> Kamara looked fast as bleep uh, yeah. on that last preseason. On that whatever it was, a fifty-three yard run, whatever it was. I didn't realize how fast he. Was. I didn't think that he would translate well into the NFL, but I mean, that dude looked quick. Yeah, yeah, he looks he looked really good going down the sideline there, uh, and and the burst he attacks the line of scrimmage. Yeah. And that's not something I remember watching a lot when I when I put his tape on at Tennessee. No. In fact, I, I remember a lot of the opposite, to be honest, and, and liking to bounce things outside and not being yeah. super decisive. Something changed inside of that guy. I wish he was in – I wish New Orleans didn't have so many running back options. I wish he had a clear role. I think it would make a really interesting decision uh, if, if people were even willing to move him up even farther than six. Uh, so for the record, Chad, it's it's one of those running backs at six, or you still have Williams there? Yeah, it's one of those running backs, and I think I think the good thing with Kamara, I mean, I guess if you look at the you know glass half full, it, it's kind of nice for for him to to be behind Adrian Peterson, Mark Ingram for you know this year, and maybe still get a little playing time. He's a guy that I wouldn't mind giving a three four year contract to because I don't think there's going to be uh, a lot of a lot of wear on those tires after this year, but I think he could really, really see the value going into next year. Um, and I mean, he's like, like you said, like we didn't see any of that in his college tape for most part. He's got to be learning something from Adrian Peterson and Mark Ingram to be able to do that this quickly uh, into the NFL. Yeah, that, but, I mean, that's I think a really this good is all point. just high. I think these are all just green flags for, him, for me at this point with him. Yeah, it's really hard to find a red red flag when you watch him play, actually. Uh, he's been he's been an eye opener for me as well, Matt. I, I I would echo a lot of the things that you said. I was just as surprised to see him make a splash this early and, and such a big splash at that. Let's let let's lump the rest of these running backs in together. We talked about those top four guys. You touched on Hunt a little bit, Chad, and and we talked about Kamara. What about the rest of this group? You got P Ryan. Deontay Foreman, Marlon Mack, Jamal Williams, Joe Williams, James Conner, and the list goes on and on. Of this group, Matt, who are the guys that really have stuck out to you? Is there anybody that's moved up a lot on your rankings or anybody that moved down? Um, well, just touch on Hunt real quick. I do agree with Chad there that he would be it would be him or Kamara there at, at 106 because Hunt. I mean, he's he's been he's been more involved than I thought he was going to be. I've been always been in the Ware camp that Ware is going to be the guy this year. Um, and he still probably is, but you know, Kareem Hunt was involved in 11 of the first 20 plays on on that week two preseason game. So they they like him, I think. Um, yeah. From the rest of those guys there, just like you were talking about, Kamara learning from from uh, Peterson and Ingram. I think Marlon Mack is doing the same thing from Frank Gore because he's another player that I really hated coming into the this preseason, and he is kind of impressing me too. 
Um, you know, if there's th those are some guys that you can really learn things from. So if th those rookies are really kind of taking that to heart and learning what those veterans have to say and kind of pushing their ego down a little bit, then both of those guys could be special. Um, and then Jamal Williams, I think, is really going to push Ty Montgomery. And, and we found out, I think it was today or yesterday, we found out that he might have a sickle cell issue also in addition to that lower leg injury. It did say he was back at practice, I think, today or tomorrow. Um, but that's a little bit more concerning. And I still am concerned about his pass protection skills. I mean, we haven't seen it yet um, that he's improved. So if that's the case, Jamal Williams has been – Got getting wave, rave reviews in that in that department. So I still like him. Uh, James Conner, I still love, but the, I think the numbers in the last game, I think he had 98 yards, 20 carries. Uh, I, I don't think he looked as good as as those numbers. Um, well, well, look in the box score, I guess I would say. So I like all of those guys. If I had to pick one, I probably would go ahead and pick, still stick with my guy, Jamal Williams, out of that, that group. Okay, so for the record, listeners, you, all these running backs got rave reviews from Matt Price. So no matter who who does well as a rookie, he, he was on the on the on the train for sure. But you say I, I'm just saying that as a joke, of course. Matt. I didn't want to throw uh, Joe Williams under the bus or P Ryan under the bus. So I, okay, know. all right. I was gonna ask if there was a negative guy, and and I think it was pretty obvious if you didn't mention him, you weren't you weren't buying in on any of the hype. Foreman did have a nice a nice catch and run this past week. Uh, but you mentioned Jamal Williams is the guy that kind of sticks out to you of the group that I mentioned. How high are you willing to go on him, Matt? Are you willing to get into the end of the first round, or are you still waiting until that second round pick to snatch up Williams? I think if I had to, I mean, if I absolutely had to, I wouldn't mind taking them at the end of the first 112 or whatever, but you don't need to. You can get them in the first half of the second round almost every time. So um, I, I don't see any reason to take them in the first yeah, I recently did see a draft, and it could have been a Packers homer, who knows, but he went at 111, and I thought it was interesting for sure. It was a running back heavy start to the draft, which a lot of them are, to be honest with you, especially these late ones, where after Davis, there's a lot of question marks at the wide receiver position, and even Davis has those injuries kind of lingering. So we, that, that draft saw nine running backs taken in the first 12 picks. And, you know, that's a lot, but Jamal Williams certainly fits into that conversation. So if you have a draft coming up and, and you're a running back heavy draft, have those kind of expectations because it can happen for sure. Chad, is there a guy out of this group, one that Matt chose or, or another that really has caught your eye that you're moving up your board? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually really upset with myself that I have like zero Marlon Mack shares um, in so far going into the 2017 season. Um, He's looked really good. I think I and I, I I'm sure I had some recency bias because you know last year I was I kind of liked Josh Ferguson and that never ended up being a thing. Um, and I kind of thought this was kind of the sort of same situation. Um, it's clearly not. Just already he's shown that he can play in the NFL and 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 make the cuts that NFL running backs need to make. Um, and and like you said, I mean he's learning from Gore, who's like the goat basically at this point. Um, I'm. I, I wish I would have bought in on Marlon Mack, and, and I'm really sad that I, I didn't. So if you, if you have a draft this weekend and Mack's on the board and you're late in the first or early in the second, are you pulling on the trigger? How how high are you willing to go to, to get a share of Mack? Early second for sure. Early second for sure. What, yeah. A couple guys that have come out of the woodwork a little bit at the running back position are, are Tyreek Cohen. I think it's Tyreek, Tarek. Cohen and D'Angelo Henderson for Denver bo both uh, were a little bit lower on the list for most dynasty owners coming into the uh, the preseason and have shown at least sparks of brilliance are you guys moving Matt I'll start with you are you guys moving these guys up the board and how high are you willing to take these guys I mean, I guess a little bit. I'm still not going to reach for him. D'Angelo Henderson, I think, is he's got a long, a, a big ladder to climb. I think if he's going to be relevant, uh, I mean, he looks he looks good in, in preseason. I can't can't uh, fault him for that. But if, if Jamal Charles is healthy, I still believe in Jamal Charles. I think C.G. Anderson is still a good player if he can stay healthy. So um, Devontae Booker has that wrist thing, but he'll be back. So I just think there's guys in front of him that he's not really going to be relevant anytime soon, um, unless he really 
either blows those guys away in, in like week three or or what they, or just due to injury and, and attrition, that kind of things. And then Tariq Cohen, I just think that John Fox is a kind of a one running back guy if he can be, and I, and I don't see any reason why he would want to go away from Jordan Howard. So I, 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 I guess having him at the back end of the roster, like maybe a spot start if you really need to just throw up, like throw in a guy there that could, you know, have, have, a, have a long touchdown or two, you know, that's somebody he would have so that's a way he would have value, but uh, I mean, I'm not going to reach for him. I just don't think he's going to have consistent value anytime, anytime soon, and certainly, any certainly not anytime soon, and probably not ever. Chad, are either of these guys in the second round for you, or are you going to keep them down in the third round? <sighs> They're probably in the third round, and I I agree with with Matt. I I think you know I love D'Angelo Anderson at this point. I think he's a uh, scream in value, going from basically undrafted in rookie drafts to the fourth, and now into the third. Um, Matt's right. He does have, you know, an uphill battle in the depth chart. But, I mean, you look at the depth chart. You got CJ Anderson, who hasn't been able to stay healthy for a full 16 and since high school, probably, I'm assuming. And he's got Jamal, Jamal Charles in front of him, who JJ, uh, is laughing at his knees. So, I mean, it's like, you know, that guy can have a spot like come week five, uh, and be basically the starting guy, if those guys, you know, show any signs, symptoms of, of injury to, to any other body parts, basically. So I, I like D'Angelo Henderson and I, I'm in on him. Tara Cohen, you know, the human joystick, they call him. Uh, I like him, but I mean, I, I don't know if he's ever going to actually amount to anything in, in the NFL. He's worth a, a, a late third, maybe fourth round draft pick in rookies. Yeah. I think they've both locked up roster spots in the NFL, but you know, yeah. as dynasty owners, we just don't know if they'll ever make a fantasy impact. So they're dart throws for sure. Another dart throw out there might be Chris Carson, yeah. Chad, out there in Seattle. Uh, you get your chances to watch him, and you'll have chances throughout the season the way it looks because they're going to have to find room on the roster for him. What do you? What are your thoughts on Carson quickly? Yeah, I think he's in. Alex Collins is probably the odd man out in that backfield. Um, he's looked good. I mean, there's, there's no – Two ways about it. He's 13 carries, 84 yards, and a touchdown in the preseason. His, uh, I think he even has a, like three catches. Uh, so he's, he's shown the ability to catch as well uh, and also pass protect for Russell Wilson back there. Um, so I, I'm sorry. I quoted somebody else's stack. It was 13 for 46 and two touchdowns for Carson. Um, still, I mean, he's had a, that goal line – that goal line run he had, I think, in week one of the preseason, ran over a few people into the end zone. I mean, that was impressive. Uh, this is the kind of guy that Pete Curl loves, man. I mean, this is this is why they brought Eddie Lacy in to do the same thing. Thomas Rawls has shown that he can't stay healthy. CJ Prosai is the same thing, now dealing with a growing injury. Uh, I think this guy has a shot to at least be the fourth round or the fourth uh, running back on the depth chart and move up uh, just because of injuries to the others in front of him. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Do you think he's just a fourth round, third to fourth round dart throw, or are you moving him up past that, Chad? No, oh, yeah, he's definitely a fourth round. I probably wouldn't even take a third on him at this point, which which might be a little silly con- considering all the all the good news coming out of Seattle on him. But uh, I, there's still some guys I like in that third that I'd rather have over him. Yeah, it's probably going to take him uh, contributing on special teams to to just be active on game day, first of all. And then it, it'll take at least one injury for him to, to, to get any looks uh, on the playing field in the regular season in the backfield with Russell Wilson, for sure. Let's, let's rotate. let's did a fumble on special teams, too, last week. Yeah, I saw it, and I'm sure Carroll just loves that. Uh, yeah, so exactly. it's going to buy him a ticket onto the roster, for sure. It sure yeah. seems that way, anyway. So I mean, let's every- Everybody in front of him is hurt. Rawls is hurt again. Lacey's fat again. And Prosai said there was a report today that they're worried about him. So, I mean, he might be the starter by default. I, I went back and looked at some scouting reports on him, and most people seem kind of, you know, eh about him. But maybe he's 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 doing it in camp. And P. Carroll, obviously, we know that he he values that competition. So Right, I mean, and he, he loves the diamond in the rough. If, if there's Absolutely. a coach that loves the diamond in the rough, it's Pete Carroll. For sure. We're, we don't have a whole lot of time left, fellas, so let's shoot through these wide receivers. We talked about Corey Davis, and we touched on Mike Williams. First of all, fellas, one-word answer. Is Mike Williams still a first-round pick for you, Matt? Uh, yeah, I guess. That's more That's than one too, word. Chad, <laughs> Chad, is he a first-round pick? Absolutely. 
Okay, I, I tend to agree, uh, with the exception that if you're in a contract league, you need that immediate return. You might push him out of the first round. I could sur- sure see that happening. Beyond Drew those Dynasty, guys, yes. who, who's the other first round pick at wide receiver for you, Chad? Is there another one? Oh God, I don't think so. I mean, you're not taking John Ross. John Ross is like the fringe guy that I would think of, and I probably would draft him over like an Evan Ingram and Joku and probably OJ Howard just because I hate drafting tight ends. In the first oh, round. that's going to make Matt angry. Matt, go. Yeah. Uh, I would take John Ross ahead of Mike Williams personally, but I want to go ahead before you start throwing out these others' names, Dan, and I want to talk about my boy Cooper Cup because that guy <sighs> is playing out of his mind. Well, you know, Matt, my question was, is there another first-round <laughs> wide receiver? Is Cup a first-round wide receiver? No, but he's definitely a second-round wide receiver. Okay, I think how just high because- are you going? <laughs> how high? I mean, I, I am crazy, so I would take him early second, no problem. And I have taken him early second. So You know, uh, I seem to remember we did a live draft show, and you mentioned him at as a fringe first to second-round yeah. pick. Way back then. So if there's a guy that's been on the bandwagon the whole time, it's certainly Matt Price. And you and Nick would not just just not let me let me go. You just took me to task on him and look at it. Right now, here's the hot take. I'm calling it. He's going to lead that team in receptions over Sammy You know, that's not that hot a take. I mean, the guy has looked like dynamite. Lead all (laughs) rookies. Lead all yeah, rookies that, that, would be yeah. a hotter day. Yeah, okay, fine. Leads all leads all rookies in reception. Oh, I love it. That's, if that's the that's case, like, then he should be a first round pick. But he's gonna be like twentieth in yardage. <laughs> <laughs> Lead all among twentieth in yardage. That's brutal. Yeah, among rookies. Yeah. So I, I've heard the, and I'm gonna give you a chance to <laughs> to comment on him for sure, Matt. I've heard the the talk, the Wes Welker ish type conversation that that slot guy that's shifty and, and can make people miss. Uh, I, you know, a lot of people are using the easy way out on that. What do you see in Cup that makes you so excited about his potential in Los Angeles? I just think he's he's the exact receiver that Jared Goff needs to be successful. He's the guy who's going to be where he's supposed to be when he's supposed to be there. He's going to make the catch whether or not it's right on his numbers or if it's above his head. If it's down on the ground, he's going to make the catch. Um, you know, I, I don't know if he can play outside, and I don't think he needs to with both Watkins and uh, and uh, Woods there now. Um, but I just I just think he's going to be, like you said, one of those kind of big slot receivers that, that can lead his team in receptions every single year. I think he is a weapon in the red zone. Um, you know, I, I don't think he's going to be explosive as uh, or maybe have as many yards, obviously, as a guy like Sammy Watkins if he stays healthy. But I just think he's going to be very valuable that offense. And, and it, it maybe kind of like a – this isn't a great comparison, but maybe kind of like a souped up Cole Beasley a little bit. You know what I mean? Like he ha- he offers more than Cole Beasley does. He's a different player. He's bigger than Cole Beasley, but kind of in that role where where the quarterback really just kind of leans on him in every situation. Yeah, and he's completely destroyed my Farrell Cooper shares that I had yeah. from from a year ago for sure. I, I I share a lot of the the thoughts that that you do now, Matt. Watching them in, in the, those two preseason games, you know. I don't know. Jared Goff didn't look good at all until Cooper Cup came to town. So, and, and Goff yeah. is getting good reviews as well. I think there's a connection there for sure. How about you, Chad? We we gave Matt his pedestal to stand on uh, on the Cooper Cup bandwagon. <laughs> is there a receiver out of the group that that is consisting of Juju Smith Schuster and Curtis Samuel, Chris Godwin, Zay Jones? We can throw into that conversation. Taiwan Taylor. Uh, any of those guys that really grab your attention and that you're moving up for it? I mean, not really. I mean, I really like Chris Godwin. Uh, everything out of camp is, has been glowing for him as well. But, I mean, he's another guy that, you know, he's not playing any slot right now. He's basically just playing on the outside where D-Jax and Mike Evans are. So, I mean, they, they're apparently still going to run out Humphreys uh, every, every game until, you know, that's not cool anymore. But, uh, he's a guy that I like. I can't really move him up just because I just don't see an immediate return at this point. But uh, he's a guy that is probably my favorite out of those. Uh, Zay Jones is a guy that's interesting. You know, he he had a lot of hype, especially after, uh, you know, when him and Watkins were going to be the starters. Then Watkins got traded. Bolden signed. Bolden retired. Watkins, you know, now he seems to be like the de facto number one guy. So I don't really know. Again, this is, I don't know what's going on in Buffalo. Um, And I I don't know if some point Peter Peterman is going to be the starting quarterback in, in Buffalo. 
Um, if it is, it's probably a better sign for, for, for Zay Jones. But at this point, like, I just, he's another guy that I just, I never really got that I didn't buy any shares of and I might regret it. But if, if I do, then, you know, I, I'm okay if I regret it. Yeah. You know, the situation in Buffalo reminds me a little bit of the situation in Jacksonville that we talked about a little bit earlier. The quarterback is has question marks surrounding him. The rest of the roster, there, there's things, kind of shakeups happening. All the trades that happened, it seems like that coaching staff and that front office has gotten off on a rough, on the wrong foot, to be very blunt. And, you know, I, I don't want to pour too much cold water on my Zay Jones love. But Come it, on, just, Dan. Bring me the fire with Zay. Where is the fire from earlier this offseason? You know, I've talked like, about it He's so a much. first round pick, baby. I do not I have that fight. I'm not backing away from anything <laughs> I've said at all, especially if you're in a true dynasty league. Uh, I'm all in on Zay Jones. But there, there are so many head-scratching things happening in Buffalo right now that I'm just – like in a redraft, you know, sure he's going to be on the field, but can we really count on anything from Zay Jones? Uh, I, like I said, I don't want to throw a whole bunch of cold water on it, but it, there, there just seems to be too many things that, that aren't going the right way. And, and a lot of people look at it like, holy cow, doesn't all this mean that Zay Jones is going to be on the field and somebody has to catch the ball, all those things, and that's all true. But I, I don't think he's going to catch the world by fire by any means. I certainly think he could catch some passes, make some good plays, and I think a long as a long-term investment, he is a solid one, as solid as anybody. I still have him right up there, uh, but I don't think I have to preach about Zay Jones any more than I already have this offseason. How about, how about the rest of this list? So uh, are you saying you'd be surprised if he wasn't like the next Justin Hardy? I wouldn't be shocked, no. I, I, I wouldn't be shocked. I, I think he's so much more talented than than Justin Hardy or or any of those other, any other busts that you can kind of <laughs> name spit out at this point. I, I think he runs such great routes. If, if you get the chance to watch him, just just go on YouTube and type in every Zay Jones preseason, and and there's videos out there that'll that'll show every route that he's run, and he's so he's like smooth. Like in the background, people people yeah, talk. Give it to you. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I mean, off the line of scrimmage, people talk about him off the line of scrimmage, and he is so smooth yeah. uh, against press coverage. Watch him dip his shoulder and get that corner to put his hand on his back instead of his chest or shoulder, and he's behind the defender so quickly. It doesn't matter if you run 4-5 at that point. It really doesn't. You're, you're already a step past him. He needs a quarterback to get him the ball. He needs he, he needs another receiver, most likely, to take the, the pressure off of him. He's got – Big upside, but I, I really do want to say that it is long-term upside. It's not necessarily 2017 upside. Let's talk about the rest of this list, fellas. Who's – who's Matt, you, you touched on Cup, but you ignored everybody else, including Dave Jones. <laughs> Nobody else does. <laughs> <matters. laughs> does anybody else exist among that rookie no, wide receiver wanted, class? I wanted you to talk about Zay because I've been impressed with what I've seen this preseason. Really? Okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I was not in at all on him before. Like, I think you probably remember that. I was giving you crap about right. him, but – um i've been impressed with what i've seen i like i said like you said you know that situation in buffalo is rough so it could be a little while but i've been impressed with him uh you know Corey davis hasn't been on the field so taywan taylor's been making plays i don't i don't want to read too much into that but he is playing with with uh i can't remember if he's playing with the starters or not but he is on the field um curtis samuels man i, I don't i don't know I, we haven't really seen him right so uh i don't really this know what week. to do with him yeah, hopefully this week. Juju, I've never been a really big, a big fan of. So, um, And then, I mean, I don't know how many more things we can say about Galladay. He's been great in the preseason, that one game. Although the last the last, in week two, we only had one catch for – was it one catch for one yard, something like that? So maybe we cool our jets a little bit there. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. These these guys – none of these guys really, except for except for Cooper Cup, really really uh, do anything for me right now. Yeah, and, and – Taylor's been playing mostly with the backups. I think he got a few snaps with the with the starting unit, but I don't think those expectations lie there for the regular season. He's most likely a second string type guy, guy that's going to fill in in the slot, maybe the long term plan for after one of those veterans move on. Uh, Chad, you you got your chance to talk about these receivers. I'd like to know what you think of these tight ends since you threw a little bit of hot coffee on the tight ends a little bit earlier when you said uh, you're not taking them in the first round. You're moving all these other position players above them. I know that'll, that'll piss off our buddy, Matt, 
But what, <laughs> what's your reasoning with the tight ends? Is it just a long narrative that tight ends take so long to to mature in the league, or is it something else? Yeah, I mean, I think it has to do with that. And it's just, I, I just, at, at a one-off position, like, I just, I don't know. I I feel like I can stream tight ends if I need to and, and get the same sort of production that, that you know, anybody outside of Gronk and Kelsey and, and maybe Eifert can, can give you uh, any given week. And it's a lot of draft capital to to invest in a tight end at you know mid mid first round where you know I could I could keep stacking a wide receiver running back there and and uh, you know if I need to I can I can offer I can always trade for a tight end and I'd rather have a veteran than a rookie. So so since you don't like these top end guys or at least you don't like where they're going in the draft, is there one of these late round guys that you're willing to throw a dart at? Yeah, and I I talked about I think it was you it was you and I uh, a few weeks ago. Gerald Everett uh, was the guy that that I was really onto, and then you know you you saw what he did in in, in week two of the preseason. I think that guy is 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 pretty special, and I know Tyler Higby is still there, and I know you're a fan of him as well. Um, and I, I might have been a little too bullish when I said you know basically write off Tyler Higby, but Gerald Everett seems to be the answer there at tight end. Uh, in that offense, they seem to love him. Uh, this is a new management, you know, they're under new, under new, uh, GMs and coaches, and they're the ones that want to Gerald Everett. They didn't draft Tyler Higby. So I, I, I kind of tend to lean towards, uh, Gerald Everett as the guy to, to own in dynasty at rookie uh, for rookie tight end. Yeah. I, I, I got a chance to watch Everett play this, this past week as well. And I was impressed. Uh, like you were, like you said, I, I I'm a Higby guy. I, I still believe in him. I think it's a coin toss myself as to who's going to be more productive over the long haul. Uh, but there, there's certainly some talent there with Everett for sure. Matt, you are a proponent of these top end tight ends. Tell me why, who you like best, and what's the order of those top three tight ends in your rookie draft if you're having one this weekend? I, I Honestly, I go back and forth on all of them. I like all three of them a lot. Uh, I do have some concern that OG How OJ Howard is such a good blocker. He's going to be held in to, to block more. So I think that's a – I mean, it's not concerning, but it's some, certainly something to think about. I think Ingram is the safest of the of those top three. I think he's going to be involved right away. He had – not that it mat- matters really, but he did lead the team in targets in the last preseason game. Um David and Joko, I just think the upside is so high. You know, like yeah. I, I, he think he's a little bit more raw than the other guys. I think people think that he is a better blocker than he actually is. So, um, so I do think he's somebody you might have to wait on. Although he's going to have more better, uh, more opportunity, I think, than than the other two as well. So he could capitalize on that. Uh, so I, I think right now I, w- I would just have it Ingram, Howard, and Joku personally. Um, but I like them all, and I, I think they're all first round. I just think that I just think that fantasy owners and, and the NFL in general are just hungry for some talent at tight end right yeah. now. Look at what Hunter Henry is being sold for right now, and I think yeah. all three of these guys are more talented than Hunter Hunter Henry. So I just don't think they're a bad investment. I realize you're probably going to have to wait, but I think pe- the teams that are going to be in the range to take these guys in rookie drafts probably already have a, you know a decent and okay starter ahead of them, and they can afford to wait a year or two if they need to. So I think it's an investment in the future. I think if you take these guys you're definitely looking ahead and not necessarily for this year uh, yeah, for sure it's interesting at this point in the year we're starting to slowly see these tight ends get walked down draft boards as well I've, I've been keeping an eye like I said I have I have a couple of rookie drafts left and I've been keeping an eye on on other drafts that happen via Twitter and on MFL and things like that and it seems like consistently the tight ends are the ones getting bumped down just a little bit and I think that offers a little bit of an opportunity to, to dynasty owners that are willing to take the leap and the leap of faith that in a couple of years, that's going to look like a brilliant pick, especially when you're getting these guys in the second mid to second round. It seems like a, a big value yeah. to me. Uh, let's move to quarterbacks and we'll go under center for just a minute. Talk one quarterback leagues. First of all, fellas, Chad, how quickly in a rookie draft would you be willing to take one of these quarterbacks? Who is it? First of all, how fast are you willing to take them? How early in a draft? And what's the reason in a one quarterback league? I probably won't take one in a rookie draft uh, if it's a one QB, unless I have like Tom Brady and like, I don't know, Sam Bradford. I'll take Mahomes. I'll take uh, Watson late third. But okay. I usually I, I won't even touch a quarterback. Matt, same question. Are you touching any of these guys in the in the in a one quarterback league? 
like Chad said, not maybe maybe the early third. I really like Mahomes. What I've seen from him so far, he may be the most blocked currently, but I, I, I he's still my number one. I think Trubisky's looked really good. Watson has had his moments. Kaiser's looked good. I just I just don't need to take one of these guys in a one quarterback league. I would rather spend up and pay for uh, a, a proven starter than than rely on one of these guys. Yeah, you're you're not gonna if if you're taking them, you're taking them as a backup. And is there really a reason to have a backup on the roster, let alone spending any kind of draft equity? on them let's switch to super flex and two quarterbacks matt how quickly are you willing to take your top guy at quarterback i would take i would take towards the mid to late round maybe even at that 106 107 range where we just don't know what to do i might go ahead and throw a dart at mahomes or trubisky there um i I wouldn't be mad if somebody did that i think i probably would personally wait a little bit later if i could you know more towards like 110 or later but uh, i certainly don't hate taking in the middle of the round yeah, I, I, I personally prefer Deshaun Watson just slightly, and it's a close group for, for me. And uh, I considered him at 108 recently in a rookie draft, but that was a that was a super flex where I had older veterans. Tom Brady was my top quarterback. Uh, and and I like you said, it was just that group of players where you're not all that sure. Uh, I, I ended up going a different direction, but I certainly – uh, considered them. How about you, Chad? Super flex league. How quickly are you willing to pull the trigger? Uh, so super flex. Usually, uh, most of my super flex are rookie auctions. So I haven't really got to draft a whole lot of super flex. But the one in dead that dead presidents that you you commish, uh, I was pretty ecstatic grabbing Deshaun Watson at one hundred and nine. I mean, that's. Yeah. That's yeah, that's awesome. a nice spot. And that's kind of what I was talking about just a minute ago when I said I was considering him. He went a few picks later, so it wasn't I, – I think consistently those quarterbacks go in that 107 to 202 range. The top guy's usually off the board before the last three picks in the first round or at least before before the end of the first round for sure. Last thought from you guys before we wrap things up. I need to know who is that flyer that you're taking in the third round right now our listeners have drafts this weekend and they have that late round special that they can't wait to whip out in front of all their buddies. Matt, who's the guy for you? I'm going to go with our Darius Stewart. Look, I know it's a hot mess. We didn't get a chance to talk. Talk about. Yeah. I I, I know it's a hot mess there. Kackenberg, he was scoreless on, was it 13 drives or something in the preseason? It was not good after he had, he actually looked okay in week one of the preseason, but week two was not good. But you know that the receiving core is wide open. There is literally nobody there unless you're big on Robbie Anderson. Uh, Sharon Peak is a little bit intriguing, but I really think that if Stewart is healthy, you know he can be that quarterback's best friend. Not exactly like Cooper Cup, but sort of like Cooper Cup, where he's going to be that guy who can play close to the line of scrimmage and, and really rack up the uh, well, rack up the yards. Chad, I'll who's the guy for like, you? Uh, yeah, the guy for me is a guy we already talked about is D'Angelo D'Angelo Henderson. I I just I I see his path is not as blocked as most people because of uh, who's in front of him and their injury history. And I think this guy just he looks the part, and everybody's compared him, you know, to to a little bit of uh, MJD. And I think that's kind of spot on. And you know, if that's if he's half of what MJD was, you're going to steal in the third round. So I, I like, I really like him, and 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 we'll draft him every time in the third. Okay, so the listeners heard it here first. Take Henderson, take our Darius Stewart, and get those sleepers in the third round for my podcast brethren, Chad Scott, as well as Matt Price. This has been the 268th episode of the DLF Dynasty Podcast. We'll catch you again next week. Sweet. Nice. Gosh, I that thought we were, for a minute, I thought we were going to be at like 45 minutes, but then we, we extended the uh, wide receiver talk, so that went, went really good. That wasn't bad. I hope, about a, about I hope you guys think it was a, it was a worthy episode. I, 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 I had, had a lot good. of fun. It was really good. I had a lot of fun, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's yeah. Get, our, uh, get our recordings into the folder so they have those. I hope, uh, I hope, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we will have guests too, but I do hope most of our in-season stuff is the three of us. Yeah, I think we should focus on it, uh, to be honest. What was that, 269? 268, right? Yeah. I was going to yeah. say nice. But... <laughs>
Almost nice. Dude, I was at Almost. a state softball tournament this past weekend. Yeah, how'd that go? Not good. We won our first game and then oh, lost no. the next two and we were out. So no. we got like 21st place or 19th place in a field of 29, <laughs> uh, which is odd because it was supposed to be 36. And a bunch of teams didn't show up. Uh, anyway, so we're sitting at our tent between games and – there, one of our, my teammates is telling a story about some girl she, he hooked up with and didn't say anything, no attributes about the girl or anything. And he, the other guy goes, she, he goes, yeah, we hooked up in the back of the camper. And this guy goes, nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, oh, my God, that was Chad Scott. And <laughs> that would have been me too. Yeah. Sure and been. then like no shit. Two minutes later, somebody said something about, Oh, that's too long for this. And he, and the same guy goes, that's what she said. And like, <laughs> oh, shut up. That might've been me, man. I, I, I miss playing softball. We won a state tournament once. Yeah. I have one win and a second place that I don't remember due to a concussion. But that's a new. We won nationals, state tournament. We I, I retired after we uh, we went to Worlds in Orlando. Oh my gosh, that's uh, way five, better than we've ever been. Yeah, five years ago, Worlds and I, for I hung them up. I didn't know. Is What's this that? like a rec? Like what? What is this like a? What kind of like league is this? Like what kind of world championship? So like softball is pretty hardcore, basically, and like there's different there's different like leagues like A, B, C, D, E. Um, and you get and classified basically like a, so, like a yeah, church and there is too. Yeah. Yeah. And so like, you know, you basically get classified on like basically who's your team, how good you are, that sort of thing. And, uh, we went to sea worlds, um, which sounds funny. Sea world, um, in Orlando and we went like two sea and two. World so we in, did our... in Orlando. Awesome. I know. I was like, this is, this is really funny, but yeah, it was, uh, it was fun, man. It was it was it was hot and humid and gross, but it yeah, was yeah. it was fun. That's that's Florida. Yeah. Yeah, it was I terrible. I, I actually hated it, but Florida is I hung one of them the up worst, after that. Worst places. I was done. I was sweating like right when we got off the off the plane. I was like, this is All this right, we're done. <laughs>